thank you everyone who's come in to our second attempt at having our um, webinar today to look at the coral rescues effort in the Mesoamerican reef. So um, a little housekeeping just to start off. This is being simultaneously translated. That was our problem the other day and we have it fixed. So Antonio is our translator. If you would like to have translation, go down to the bottom next to the Q&A. Um, you can see English or Spanish as your choice. So put in the language you would like to hear if you want the translation service. And then you also have that option that says mute original audio. That's your choice, whether you want to be able to hear the person slightly that's actually speaking, or you want to just have that muted and only hear the translator. So, okay. So I will um, start this off by giving you the bio of our first speaker, who is Elisa Blanda from the Mesoamerican Reef Fund. Um, she's an Italian marine biologist who graduated from the University of Padua in Italy and has a double degree in natural sciences and aquaculture from Roskilde University in Denmark and the National Taiwan University. She was, she's been living in Guatemala since 2015 and working since 2018 at the Mara Fund. She was a small grants program officer, so many of you may know her through that. Um, she's in charge of reviewing the process of the small grants and proposals, follow-up on projects, and um, she has a lot of experience with um, mollusks, feeding ecology, fish reproductive behavior, culture and use of live um, marine aquaculture, water quality, phytoplankton, um, marine microalgae blooms, and other things. So she's very happy to be here and working with us all in the Mesoamerican Reef and getting to dive and do some other lecturing as well. So I'll turn it over to you, Elisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Do you hear me well? Yes. Very good. Very good. First of all, I would like to thank you all for this invitation in the name of Marfan and all the team and for also organizi organizing this important workshop. This workshop is titled Coral Rescue and Beyond, Practical Initiatives to Rescue Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease, Affected Corals, and Looking Towards the, the Future. So uh, it's very important uh, for us and very known faces to talk about this important issue and problematic that we have to deal um, in the MAR um, during the last few years, right? So the, today, our guests that I will present later on um, will we'll share and present with us, to us their progress, their knowledge about this new threat and what are the initiatives, the projects, collaboration and future goals for the protection of this vital resource, Coral Reef. So thank you, Melanie, for introducing myself. I would like to say about uh, something more about this, um, this webinar is also part of a project that the small grants uh, program is supported. So what is the small grants? What we do at Marfund? Uh, every year we support proposals and from organizations, governmental, non-governmental, academia, community groups that submit proposal projects to our Request for proposal, those pr proposals are selected, are evaluated, and then are awarded with a grant, usually uh, up to 3,000 US dollar. In Mexico, we have help from our member fund, Mexican Fund for Nature Conservation, that is very relevant for us, for MAR fund, which thank you, thank you the support with, uh, of Cynthia Landa, our focal point, supports and give follow-ups to projects. During the 12th uh, request for proposal, the project entitled Rescue of Emblematic Coral Species at Risk of Local Extinction Due to Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease was presented by Amigo de Isla Contoy and was approved. And today we will see some good results 
that they will share with us. It was implemented by an extraordinary team composed mainly by uh, mainly of women, and it's super nice and important. And I can see the, the people that are presenting today are mostly women, right? So um, I can name a few: Melina Soto from HRI, Claudia Padilla from Criapina Pesca, and Anastasia Banesnak from Unam Coralium who are joining us also today. So uh, we will learn a little bit more about surprising results in the region, and also the important um, knowledge of other colleagues in, in the United States, I think, and Belize, right? And we would also like to show you for I'll let you know that we believe the work done during this project will be also strengthened through the regional demonstration project for the stony coral tissue loss disease, which is carried out by MARFON and with the support of the countries of the MAR and with funds from the CCAD, uh, the MAR2R project. The regional demonstration project will also include a regional dialogue, group of experts, harmonized national action plan, and more ecoregion. We will train key actors in the identification and monitoring of story coral tissue loss disease, as well use of interface to report the disease and all the data at greater Caribbean level. So this is essential and very important for understanding the new threat and for improving the collaboration of effort uh, in the MAR. So we encourage all of you, all of you participants today to uh, join us in this effort and work together. So these initiatives and others that will continue in the future will be strengthened with your knowledge, with uh, our support, and uh, the important also um, presence of these important experts that we have with us today, volunteers as well, and other collaboration collaborators. So on behalf of the MAR team and the Mexican Fund for Financial Conservation, I wish you the best of luck in this webinar, and I hope, with myself included, that we can learn more about this threat. How can we work together and can contribute to the conservation of the Mesoamerican Reef? So today we will have some presenter. I think. Kara Foreman will be the first, exactly, Melanie? Um, well, next we're gonna have Anya give the introduction that, that Melina Soto okay. had prepared. So that's just gonna give an overview okay. of the project. And then Kira will be the first talk after that. So. Perfect. So we will also have Claudia, Eddie, Beth. Then we'll have a break. And then we have some talks from Anastasia and Mary, and we'll have the question and answer session. So uh, while we um, present uh, um, the panelists, you can write your name in the chat, your organization and the country you are listening from. Then you can also use um, all the tools from the Zoom is maybe raise your hand or write question and answer questions in the question and answer section. And afterwards at the end, Mel Melanie uh, will help us reading all the questions and we will get answer from the person you are uh, um, giving the, the question to. If it's open, just please write it's open so anyone can uh, answer your question. So I don't know if we can add something more and I give the words to you, Melanie. Thank you so much and enjoy. Thank you. And I'll just hand it over to Anya, who's going to give Melina's talk. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you see my presentation and hear me okay? Yes, all good. 
Perfect. Um, I'm stepping in for Melina Soto to give you um, an introduction to this project, uh, which is called Rescue of Emblematic Coral Species from Local Extinction Due to SCTLD. Uh, so this is um, just a, a quick video to show, I hope, yes, the movement of um, the SCTLD through Florida, which moved about 450 kilometers in four years. And uh, whereas once it reached Mexico, uh, it, it ran or spread um, for the same distance within six months. So this is quite uh, shocking of course, for us here in Mexico as to how quickly it spread. And um, there we go. Um, and just to put it into perspective, you know, for the state of Quintana Roo, um, basically this disease has killed in one year, in less than one year, the equivalent of uh, coral mortality over the last 40 years. So obviously this is of great uh, concern here in Mexico. Um, um, and fortunately, uh, there has been a really great response to this to date um, with collaborations between institutions, especially in terms of training and monitoring and uh, in terms of communication and outreach, both um, between institutions and also to the general public, just to make them aware of what is going on and what they can do um, to try to help the situation. And of course, there have been treatment trials um, which have had different levels of success um, that have been done um, in, in areas where corals have been severely affected. Uh, another uh, response has been to take some management measures. Uh, for example, in Cozumel, they've uh, set up um, periods of rest for different reefs and basically alternate between reefs where they take uh, tourists so that the um, reefs that are at risk have, have a chance to try to recover. And also uh, in August of last year, after a series of meetings um, between different institutions, uh, there were 47 involved in total with 119 partners. Um, an action plan was produced, uh, which had 57 short to long-term actions. And one of these actions was to design a project to bank living and cryopreserved uh, coral genetic material. And that's basically what we'll be talking to you about today. Um, because we were involved in a pilot, pilot project for banking the live tissue and for cryopreserving gametes with a focus on highly susceptible species, um, Dendrogara cylindras, Meandrides meandrea, and Diploria labyrinthiformis with a grant for just a little over $21,000 from Marfond. So um, the first thing that um, uh, Melina took care of was with the communication was to basically make up wanted posters um, where we just very quickly explained the situation and were asking for people who are diving in the area to look for uh, these three particular species and to report them preferably with a photo and a GPS sighting. And so those, those data were then put into a database and uh, are, are in a, a database in HRI. And so the purpose of this talk today, or this session, uh, is to communicate our results and to share our experiences and the lessons that we have learned as well as give options to plan next steps in areas where SCTLD might just be starting and uh, to create synergies between institutions. I think that's basically the most important thing is to make sure that uh, there's collaboration between institutions uh, to make um, any response as efficient as possible. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Anya. Okay, so now we're going to get on into the program. Um, we're, it's in two sections. So the first of our talks is, well, the series of talks, we have four talks that are focused on saving the present. And then the last two talks are focused on saving the future. We're switching the order just a little bit because Kira is supposed to be in the field today and we're trying to accommodate her field schedule, which is fantastic that she's actually getting out to check on her 
her um, salvaged corals. And uh, so we're going to let her go first in this section. Kira Foreman Castillo is the technical manager and senior biologist for the Ho Chan Marine Reserve. Uh, she holds a bachelor's degree from, in biology from the University of Belize and a master's degree in protected areas management from the University of International Cooperation in Costa Rica. She's been with Whole Chan for the past 15 years, but has been working in marine conservation in Belize for almost 20. In Whole Chan, she's responsible for the research and monitoring program and providing technical support for all other activities. She leads the stony coral tissue loss disease efforts in the northern part of Belize and has been assisting the fisheries department at the national level to address the disease response. So Kira, I will let you share screen and go ahead and go through your talk. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm actually coming to you all directly from the field on the back of it. I'm still on the cat. The guy just went out to put them some more um, restoration ropes. So um, just to start off, I, I wanna, let me see if I can make this bigger. Okay, is that better? So just to start off, I want to thank um, HRI for inviting me to give this talk about our work, about the nurseries that we have and what we're doing to address stony coral. Even though we're still in the early stages of our work, or we call it an experiment, we have begun to see some positive results and we are excited to share our results with everyone. Um, some of you will, would recognize some of the slides as I'm presenting, because we presented this information as an e-poster at the recent GCFI meeting. And for the purpose of the webinar, though, I will only focus on the rescue nurseries portion of that presentation. But just as a bit of a background, stony coral was first detected in northern Belize in 2019. And since then, it has affected more than 55 miles of reef. It's been moving south from, south from the first site of infection, and it was recent, recently detected out in Lighthouse Reef Atoll. There has been two forms of interventions taken to address stony coral tissue loss disease, one being the treatment of with base 2B and antibiotic, which has proven successful. However, in Belize, there are multiple factors that affect the success rate of this treatment method. One is the cost. Two, the accessibility um, of base 2B. Um, it has to be shipped into Belize. It has to be ordered and shipped. And for those who have who have done so, um, they can attest that the process to get it in isn't very easy. The quantities of treatment currently available to responders are still small. In the US and Mexico, they've been working on rescuing corals to aquariums to put back into the reef at a future date. But this was not an option for us here because we don't have any facility in country to do that. So the idea of having the in-situ nurseries came from observations um, of the work being done by fragments of hope here in Belize and they have had good um, they have had experience and good success with placing pillow coral fragments in nurseries so we prioritized our first efforts to rescue this particular species because they're the um, most vulnerable we don't have many of those colonies left so we wanted to rescue some of them and try to keep them safe using the resources available to us. Apart from stony coral, um, coral, as a strategy to mitigate the impact of SCTLD, we are seeking to increase the restoration work with aquaporids to restore affected reefs since they are not affected by the, by the disease and with the intention to outplant to reefs that have been um, impacted by SCTLD. So the rescue initiative is a collaboration between Fragments of Hope, Belize Fisheries Department, and Holchan Marine Reserve. So SCTLD has affected the three most northern MPAs. These areas are part of the Northern Belize Barrier Reef Complex. So they're very important at the system level for connectivity. There are currently two tables set up, one in Bacalar Chico and one in Holchan. And just yesterday, um, the team from Fragments of Hope, we're actually out here working today, set up two new nurseries in Kikaka. And so we'll, and we'll, be, so we'll be working with those two nurseries and with the whole trend nursery over the next few days. 
So there they are. So we have one north, south, and the two, and those two. So the restoration methods used are those developed by Fragments of Popa, as mentioned, and you can find them, they're all available online, the manuals to be downloaded. I posted the link in the corner of the slide for anyone who's interested. And the photos just show the different um, steps that we take in the restoration. So the nursery tables, they were established as a trial to rescue pillar corals, as I've mentioned, these cylindras. It's a rare and susceptible species of coral to enhance and to enhance the aquapore population in the event that there will be high mortality of other coral species that are susceptible to SCTLD. So instead of having a reef with no corals, we have um, we're increasing our restoration efforts so that we can outplant this particular species. The aquapores can thus be outplanted to enhance the ecosystem and provide structure and habitat. There are also um, there were also established to test if the in-situ nurseries for pillow corals would be successful and they wouldn't get infected by SCTLD. What appeared to be um, healthy fragments were placed away from infected colonies and monitored. Note that since there was the absence of healthy parent colonies in some instances, we had to take fragments to, from already infected parent colonies. The preference to not take from these infected colonies that we had to, is to reduce the chance of moving the disease from one area to an X, and also introducing the disease into the nursery, especially if it's not a new nursery. So if you are, and if you have already have a fragments within the nursery, we we'll want to get those infected. So what we have seen so far, um, for the table in Bacalar Chico, in the nursery, there were three ropes of Acer vicornis and a total of 34 fragments. The Acer fragments were affected by the recent leaching event. There were 37 fragments of um, D cell in the nursery. In Bacalar in Chico, the disease is widespread and we were unable to find D cell colonies that were not affected. So the fragments came from parent colonies that were already manifesting signs of disease is not our preferred preference. Although these parent colonies were already showing signs of disease, um, SCTLD did not present within the fragments until um, September, four months after they were placed in the nursery. So to, uh, my, uh, when I initially did this presentation, I was I knew of only one fragment that was infected, but I was recently updated by the Bacalachica biologist who is here with me that they have, because they didn't go out and check it over the past um, month, I, two months, I think he mentioned, they have now seen um, disease spread within those fragments, but only within one, um, one genet, not within the two. So they'll be taking some action to remove those fragments from the table. But the other ones that were taken from more healthier looking corals, they're still doing well. And the bleaching did not affect the pillar corals within the nursery at all. So at the Holchan nursery, when the nursery was first set up in May, there were 76 diesel fragments in the nursery. Two parent colonies were from heavily diseased areas, but the selected colonies were not manifesting any signs of disease. So the other two parent colonies were from areas with no signs of disease. A few weeks after the nursery was set up, we saw the first sign of SCTLD appearing within the nursery on the fragments that came from the disease site. So unlike the Bacalar Chica case, these fragments were moved from the, from the table immediately and they were taken back to shore. And the nursery was checked every at two weeks interval and each time there were recurring signs of infection. So in July, due to these recurring infections, we removed all the fragments from that particular genet, from that group, that the one that started to manifest the disease first. And it, we had um, we had a pause due to COVID and there was we weren't able to go out to the site in August and September. However, in October, um, when they were checked, there was no further signs of disease, um, of any new infestation of SCTLD and all fragments are healthy. When we checked the parent colonies, however, we did see that they had become infected within the same area. 
during our last check, which was at the beginning of November, we also observed black band disease on one of the fragments. And, but since then, there are, we have 51 of the 76 fragments still remaining in Russia and they, there's no signs of disease. And that was up at the beginning of November. So we're going out there over the next few days and we're gonna be checking them again. And we're hoping that we don't have any disease. So what we have learned so far, based on our observations so far, okay, I think I, okay. So what we've learned so far, based on our observations, um, we recommend that the fragments for the nurseries, they don't come from areas with high inf infection rates. Um, this seems to be how we have put it within the nursery because after we have removed those fragments, we haven't seen um, any disease manifesting in any of the fragments, um, especially those that came from healthy areas where there were no signs of disease. So it would be best to, to get your fragments from areas that aren't currently manifesting disease in healthy areas. Um, so, because this lowers the risk of moving the disease around, we do suspect that it may be possible that the colony can be infected, but it isn't manifesting signs at the time of collection, which we think happened with one of our sets. Um, since we can't test for a CTLD before collecting, based on our experience, we just recommend that the parent colonies should not show any signs of disease. And if you can get them from areas that aren't, um, that haven't begun to show disease around in the surrounding areas. The tables need to be checked frequently, a minimum of every two weeks, because once a fragment gets infected, it wouldn't take long for the disease to infect the entire nursery. The idea is to keep the, the idea behind our whole um, in situ nurseries is to keep the nursery free of disease. So with limited resources, we realize we can't save the entire reef. So we try, we're trying to focus um, the focus is being placed in saving key species in small groups to be able to restore to impacted areas at a future date. For the upcoming, for this installation that we're doing now, the initial nurseries this week, we're hoping to not only increase the number of corals within our nurseries, but the number of different species as well. So possibly include M. cabernosa, favelata, some of the green corals. SCTL, the SCTLD response, it must be a multi-prong approach at all levels. There's no clear cut path to take when we, when we are addressing the disease. Each, each of our countries, along with the local organizations, must we work together to find the best fit approach for our specific local, national, and the regional context based on human and financial resources and response to capacity and expertise. So that's my presentation. And I want to say again, thanks to HRI for giving us the opportunity to share what we've been doing. Just so you all can see where I am. Thank you, Kira. That was great. And thanks for, you know, getting your pulling yourself out of the water when I know you really want to be out there checking on your corals. So thank you. If you can hit the uh, stop share button. Yeah, there we go. All right, so our next speaker um, is Claudia Padilla, and she um, has a PhD from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She's a senior researcher at the Center for Fisheries and Aquaculture Research um, at the Fisheries Institute in Puerto Morelos, and she's developed research projects for the evaluation of populations and the development of biotechnology for the cultivation of marine species um, of commercial and ecological importance, including black corals, queen conch, corals, and king crabs. From 2012 to 2016, she was the technical manager of the project financed by Conabio, um, looking at the restoration um, from anthropogenic damages of coral reefs in the Mexican Caribbean. She's um, promoted the establishment of mo a modular coral nursery system and the production of coral colonies by clonal propagation and sexual reproduction. Um, and as of 2016, she's coordinated restoration actions of various reef areas in northern part of Quintana Roo, as well as immediate action procedures for attention to after ship groundings on reefs. Um, she coordinates the Quintana Roo's Coral Reef Restoration Program with the goal of producing 260,000 corals. So, Claudia, I'd like you to go ahead and give your talk about the restoration effort in Mexico. Thank you. 
Oh, and listen, um, just one last thing for the presenters, try to keep to your time. If you hear this, it means you've run out of time, gotta wrap it up. I'll give you a one minute warning. Thank you. Okay. Um, I am going to speak in English because it's easier for me. Thank you everyone for attending the seminar to share with you And for me, it's, uh, I'm very happy to give you the first advancement of this project that is called Rescue of Re Coral in Risk uh, caused by SETLD, uh, where very specifically we have established a cooperation between the different institutions that are working to obtain better results, which is uh, what we want to do. In this intervention, I want to tell you the work that we're doing within SINAPESCA, which is the National Institute of Fishing and Aquaculture in Mexico. We are part of the federal government and we have a little more than 10 years working with these projects to cultivate, to produce coral colonies and develop restoration projects. So our participation in this project is with some activities for this number one objective. And it mean, it re refers to the part of rescuing or saving coral. So we have defined the reach, having a genetic bank alive. At first we establish the three species that have most affectation because of the SCTLD, the pillar coral, one of the brain corals, and another one of the brain corals. The idea is to avoid the extinction, the premature extinction of this types with the intention of having enough material to execute programs of reintroduction and development. That is the objective. And we are participating with three activities, activities one, two, one, three, and one, four. The first one is to condition two the places for uh, safekeeping, the rescued colonies. The next one, to make the rescue of live tissue of these three species that we're uh, commenting, having at least three genotypes of each of these colonies, and then go into the task of maintaining and monitoring the health of these rescued colonies. In the first uh, activity, we established a safeguarding uh, area in our installations, whether it was uh, a new one or adapting one of the existing installations, and the first units are this quarantine, quarantine uh, units, are uh, cultivation systems, each one with 580 liters capacity. And here the intention is to keep the safe keeping of the healthy tissue of colonies that show signs of uh, the illness of the field. With these systems, we keep the organisms of the, the pillar uh, coral. And as you can see, each system has four divisions. Each one is independent. 
Each one has uh, the recycling pump, temperature control, and you can handle a different genotype and if necessary, isolate a fragment for a specific genotype that can be useful. Remember that we have a, a specific, uh, artificial uh, lighting that uh, lamps that give us the full uh, light spectrum. And of course, the water is filtered and sterilized. And the other system that we're handling, it's a bigger uh, pond, a bigger tank with a capacity of 35,000 liters. We call it Mesocosmos. It's uh, open and it's the place that we use to keep the healthy colonies of uh, the corals that are uh, uh, susceptible to present the syndrome, but who are not uh, ill. So, and we are working with uh, the same with the two uh, species of pseudo. Sorry, and this tank is conditioned with the waves and aeration to aerate the water. It has natural light and uh, uh, environmental temperature, and there's an open flow of filtered water. In the activity one three, they're rescuing the live tissue of at least three different genotypes of each of these three species. I'll summarize what we do, the collections that we make. In, in the case of cylindri, all the colonies that we see at the field had signs of the illness. So what we did was to collect fragments of three different colonies. In each one, we put the three fragments for each one. The first one was in the area of Tulum. This had uh, a little illness. A small percentage uh, showed the white syndrome. Another colony was obtained in Puerto Morelos with a mortality of the colony of about 25%. And the last one was we cut three fragments that were the very last part of live tissue in the colony because the mortality was very high. Of the other species we obtained here, we had the chance to obtain healthy colonies and we collected four colonies. Three of them were from an area in Puerto Morelos and another one was a, a colony that we had in one of the greenhouses in the Cancun area and we brought it to the Inapesca, uh, and uh, they adapted very well to the system so well that we had the chance to, we can see them uh, liberate the gametes in July and August. The three colonies uh, collected from Puerto Morelos, debated between 15 and 17 of July, and the one from Cancun liberated the gametes uh, during August. The other species of objective MEA could not be collected because we had very little registrations of the live colonies on the field, and they were very small. We could not collect the three registers to have the variety that we need. So we decided to make a change 
towards the pseudodiploria, which is another species that's also highly affected by this illness. So we collected four colonies of pseudodiploria strigosa uh, right in front of Inapesca and two from that same area. And here, the colony is adapted very well. But we register the gametes of one spigosa and one clibosa, and we believe that the other colony is probably disobeyed, but we were not able to make the observation. Now, the activity of maintaining and monitoring the state the, the health of the colonies. We are learning how to do it because there's no experience. So for the time being, we want to show our experience classifying like in different stages. One case is Brusca cylindri, where we showed lesions associated apparently not associated with the white syndrome, but we show these lesions, there's no foul smell, and the border of the lesion is well defined. And apparently there is no uh, high mortality or expanding mortality. So what we have developed is a development of handling, a treatment of five to seven days, using products used in quadrophilia. This coral stock type of uh, products that help uh, heal the damaged tissue and then help to regenerate it. And we make constant changes of filter and sterilize the water. We monitor every day the change in the lesion. And what we have seen is that we recover all the tissue and the, the color improves. Another case is the signs of the illness seem to be related because there's foul smell, the tentacles are retracted and in this case, we apply a protocol where we make a remotion of the tissue that looks infected. We make a disinfection and then a, a treatment with amoxicillin two times for 28 hours each with the everyday change and the skeleton is uh, Cobra. Sometimes the lesions stabilize and the coral can grow over this uh, body, but it can show again, the illness can show again. Another case is when these lesions appear like very late after the quarantine process has happened, after 45 days, the colony had been in very good conditions. And after that, we have a lesion that could be associated with the illness, similar symptoms. So we apply the same treatment and we have been able to stop the and, and keep a good uh, health in carrying on. In, in, in the case of uh, the brain coral, they have done pretty well. What has happened is change of color, probably associated to change of uh, salinity or stress and changing the system and uh, with shadow mesh by meshes, uh, the, the coloration has come back.
So finally, which are the challenges and the opportunities in front of us? The challenge is it would be better to have a better knowledge of the agent that causes the illness in order to have an adequate treatment and internally improve the protocols of handling in the quarantine systems, learn from this experience and avoid the appearance of this illness. We also have a problem. There are many little reports of healthy colonies of the CI well, L and very little of MMEA. This is telling us that we're coming in very late in implementing these actions. And the challenge is to increase the, the genetic uh, bank with the number of species and the number of phenotypes. And finally, the opportunities. We think there's a very good opportunity with these uh, actions. The first thing is to rescue these resilient organisms that are going to be very important in the process of rehabilitation. But having had the chance to make reproduction in captivity of these colonies that are being affected by the illness is a great advance because it allows us to know more of the reproduction of these colonies and make a better handling of the materials obtained. So we have been able to collaborate in having the uh, gametes for cryopreservation so that when the gamete liberation was detected, the priority was to take this to the university for cryopreservation and in order to be able to work in reproducing uh, sexual reports. All that, that is all. The, the technicians that work, these are the technicians that work in the project. Okay, thank you, Claudia. That was great. Okay, so we're moving on and um, our next speaker, yes, it's gonna be Eddie Manzanero. He is a marine biologist who graduated from um, the Autonomous University of Yucatan and has a degree in business administration and management from the Inter-American University for Development. He works as a conservation strategy coordinator at Grupo Ishkaret, where he manages, supports, and coordinates the company's marine conservation programs, as well as collaborates in activities related to earth check certification. He has participated in projects led by Pronatura Peninsula, the Yucatan, and Sinvestav. He actively collaborates in the Queen Conch and fish projects in Shell Ha, as well as in the conservation and sexual reproduction of Acropora palmata and several other reef building species. Now he's focusing on stony coral tissue loss disease susceptible species. So Eddie, you can start sharing your screen and give your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Pues muy, muy buenas tardes. Efectivamente, el día de hoy... Les... Good afternoon. Effectively, today I'm going to talk to you about the actions of as a private sector, as Grupo Pushkalet, we are making to try to have this uh, illness, this uh, 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 eradicated. What is the Shkalet Group? It's a Mexican company leader in the tourism, which is sustainable and socially responsible. We have a group of hotels and theme parks, mainly the Shkalet Park, with receives more than 6 million tourists a year. As you know, the um, objectives of sustainable development that need to be reached by 2030, established by the United Nations, were part of the main structure 
to develop our model of sustainability, which is led by three pillars, people, the planet, and prosperity. And the planet has axes and strategies that indicate that we have to strengthen our programs of conservation and the optimization in the use of our resources. In the Chicolet Park, we have a natural attractive, which is the aquarium of coral reef. It's the only aquarium in the world where everything is alive. It has more than 1,500 organisms, corals, sponges, fish, crustaceans, echinoderms, and medusas. The exhibitions in the aquarium represent the main ecosystems uh, of reef that we can find from the deep reef to the, uh, the shallow ones. And the aquarium is characterized for having an open system. In other words, the water is obtained from the open sea, goes through the different uh, exhibitions, and ends up, goes back to the ocean. So the aquarium has the natural conditions in the environment like part of uh, the ocean. Now, what actions as uh, enterprise are we involved against this SCTLE? In 2019, we were part of the action plan of the White Syndrome, where strategies were established to fight this illness, where uh, GNOs, private companies, and the government were uh, met. And derived from this plan, Grupo Xcaret is looking to execute new projects for the rescue of corals, which are an extinction given because of this uh, illness. And that's why we are part of the project of rescue of a species, emblematic species that has the objective of establishing this genetic bank through the recovery of uh, live tissue and the cryopreservation of gametes. And we are working collaboratively with INAPESCA, UNAM, and Arrecife Saludables para Gente Saludable, or Healthy Reefs for Healthy People. Recently, the government of the state of Quintana Roo gave us the resources in the project of establishing of genetic banks on Germoplast that has this same objective of obtaining this genetic bank uh, and the preservation of gametes. We're also collaborating with INAPESCA and UNAM, and which is called Fauna and Agriculture of Mexico. And with these projects and actions, we are developing the project of uh, Noah's Ark or Arca de Noé of the Mexican coral. This has the objective of obtaining the genetic bank of the corals that are facing extinguishing uh, outside. And we are also keeping this in custody because besides these projects, our exhibitions are the safeguard of several species affected by the syndrome. We have species that are highly susceptible. You can find Mandrina mendritis, Pseudosporia, and Diploria and species with a medium fertility, or ticella. As a result, preliminary results within the project of rescue of emblematic species. On August 3rd of this year, along with the Institute of Science of the Sea and Limnology of the National University in Puerto Morelos, we received 80 substrates with the recluse from Diploria labyrinthems and 80 from uh, Orbicella. We had to adequate our installations with a closed system of 26 to 27 degrees C with a capacity of 2,000 liters. Some substrates we had to use ultraviolet line to identify the health of these recruits obtained. And you are the first to know which are the results 
of this first monitoring that we made in the month of November. In the obstacles with the Declorian recruits, we contabilized 193 recruits, and we're very happy because you can see at a plain view that they are growing and that they have approximately between five or to six millimeters in diameter. And with the stethoscope, we can see that the structure of the polyps is growing very well. It has the optimum conditions and they are in very good conditions. On the other hand, the substrates of Forticella, we could contabilize a total of 62 recruits. It has a very important characteristics, differently from Diploria. The recruits are a little bigger. You can see them from eight millimeters, some are up to eight millimeters. And with the, for the stereoscopy, we could uh, identify the growth and, and they start to fuse. So we're very happy to share this news with you about what we are doing with the efforts of uh, rescue and conservation of these recruits and the others that we have in our aquarium. All this effort is derived thanks to the protagonists of the aquarium, the team that leaders the uh, biologists Rodolfo Raigosa, Juan Jose Villegas, the technical person and the specialists. Anthony is who is responsible for the coral projects because besides this project, we also have in Group Buscaret with the program of conservation of Acura Palmata and in the administrative part, we, we have yours truly and Elba Lopez. So we're very happy to present these results to you. These are actions that in a common way as a group of Xeret, we are making to bring our uh, grain of uh, sand to the ecosystems and keeping this uh, uh, samples that are in danger of extinction in a natural environment. And we hope to share more photos and more results with you. And in the new project that we will have for 2021, and we will be very happy to continue uh, uh, giving you all this information. Don't forget to visit the park. Any question, any, anything we can do, we'll do it very gladly. Thank you very much. All right, perfect, Eddie. Thank you. That was great. Now, if you can um, you. stop sharing your screen, and yeah. our next speaker will be Beth Verchow. Um, she will tell us about the Florida Coral Reef Track Rescue Program, which is a massive effort. But Beth, um, a little about her. She's a graduate of the Ohio State University, where she studied under Luella Hillis Colinvo. I'm sure I've butchered that, sorry. <laughs> After graduation, she started her 30 year career in public aquariums and zoos at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium in Columbus, Ohio. In 1995, she relocated to Virginia to take a position as a senior aquarium curator and dive operations supervisor at the Virginia Aquarium. And she's done that for, that was for 21 years. A recent stint as director of husbandry and at the Audubon Aquarium of the Americas in New Orleans. Um, and then her years of leadership within the AZA community opened the door for her in 2018 to take on this current position as project coordinator for the AZA Florida Reef Track Rescue Project, the largest coral reef rescue in US history. So we like to hear from you now, Beth, thank you. Sure. First of all, I want to thank HRI for inviting uh, me to be a part of this great panel talking about rescue and making the foundations for a great restoration future. Um, as you all know, 
there has been a crisis brewing in the U.S.'s backyard on the Florida Reef Track. If, you, if you're not familiar with the Florida Reef Track, um, it's a 360 linear mile ecosystem that runs just north of Miami all the way down into the dry Tortugas. Such a large ecosystem, as you know, is a huge powerhouse providing homes and nurseries and hunting grounds for thousands of species of plants and animals. It's also an economic powerhouse contributing 8 billion, that billion with a B in revenue and 70,000 jobs to the state of Florida annually. If you've ever gone to Margaritaville, wanted a cheeseburger in paradise or listened to a Jimmy Buffett song, you probably get a, get a taste that it's also a cultural powerhouse. Like the Great Barrier Reef is to Australia, the Florida Reef Track is a national natural treasure for the United States. So let's take a look at what's been happening and what we know about stony coral tissue loss disease. We know that it's incredibly infectious. It's a waterborne disease and it significantly impacts mainly reef building corals of the reef track. Bacteria probably play a key role in the disease progression. Disease is incredibly virulent um, and it differs through space and time. Progression is temporal across uh, species and early histology suggests that the lesions of the disease begin in the gastrodermis of the coral, which may lead us to some really great answers of how to treat uh, stony coral tissue loss disease and even prevent it in the future. So far, so how far has the disease progressed on the Florida reef track? In 2014, as I mentioned, it was identified off of Port St. Lucie, which is a town just north of uh, Miami. And over the next five years, it has progressed all the way down to the very southern reaches of the Florida reef track. As of September and Oct October of this year, um, the Dry Tortugas National Park remains the only portion of the Florida Reef Track that still uh, has populations unaffected by stony coral tissue loss. So collectively, we are all holding our breath. Um, regular, even through the pandemic, regular routine uh, trips are, are still in observation out there. Um, but as the last that, that I know of uh, since September and October, uh, the dry tortugas is still unaffected. 22 of the 45 reef building corals on the Florida reef track are affected by coral tissue loss disease. This includes the brain, flower, cactus, and star corals. And these corals, some of which are U.S. Endangered Species Act listed corals, are the fundamental building blocks of the reef. Without them, the reef is no more. So we're faced with a really dismal situation in Florida. And with that situation, managers, scientists from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission or FWC and NOAA Fisheries and other partners devised a daring and unprecedented plan to bring hope to the Florida Reef Track. This plan would be executed by a network of experts, 10 teams, one committee, and two dedicated staff. Now some of you in our audience today may be members of these teams in some way, shape or form, or may even have sat on some of our virtual calls. For that, we thank you very much for the contributions you've made to the effort in Florida. But before going further, I wanna take a moment to give a shout out to all the Florida disease response partners that populate the network. And they're listed here, their logos. You know, corals got it right millions of years ago, and it's something we need to remember as we talk about coral restoration. Working together as a colony, you can do great things, making the possible impossible. And these institutions working together in Florida have really proven that. So while scientists and field researchers and others would hurry to determine the identity of the disease, how it was transmitted, what species actually were truly affected, how to prevent it or cure it, and even communicating to the public about it to make sure that there's a public awareness of what's going on in Florida. They decided in this planning session that a rescue would take place. And today, at the request of our hosts, I've been asked to speak more specifically about the rescue of Florida corals. 
So let's focus on the coral rescue team of which I can speak most, most effectively. The coral rescue team within the coral rescue plan were given the charge of rescuing or collecting corals from ahead of the disease progression on the Florida reef track. They would be preventing them from being infected in the first place because they would be collected ahead of the disease progression with the, with the priority of preserving the genetic diversity that is present currently on the, on the reef and eventually propagate those corals for further res for future restoration efforts. It's quite a big task. The biggest need identified by the team was to remove corals from the water in areas that had not yet been affected by the disease as quickly as possible, which led to the development of the Coral Rescue Collection Plan. The first step in developing the collection plan was to pri prioritize which coral species would be candidates for rescue. Very similar to this, the, the previous talks about prioritizing, getting the most bang for your buck, making sure that you're, you're getting the species that are most susceptible. This is also something that the, that, that the Florida plan took into consideration. Prioritization was based on, for the species collected, um, or was based on susceptibility to, this, to the disease, the speed of the disease progression across a particular colony, the prevalence of a whole colony mortality in the wake of the disease and other factors. The prioritization resulted in 16 high priority species and 14 medium priority species, 20 species total. Only high and medium priority species have been included in the collection plan due to funding and space and coral care limitations, which we're all having to deal with regardless of where you're conducting a rescue. Lower priority species were not currently, uh, excuse me, lower priority species are not currently known to be as susceptible to the disease and remain more prevalent along the Florida reef track, which allows a little bit more time to address them and more time to spend on those species that are most susceptible. Given the rescue was a new approach, the coral rescue team needed to refine the coral rescue plan. What they did know is that it would take on five, phase, five phases. And the first would be to test drive all of those mechanisms that would lead to success through the next phases. Prior to the, the formal rescue plan taking place, Pillar coral fragments were also rescued between 2016 and 2019 to begin gene banking for future restoration efforts. A large number of these rescued pillar corals were held at facilities across Florida and at a facility in South Carolina. The work with this species set a strong foundation for future phases of the plan. As I mentioned, it's five phases. So let's go into each phase just a little bit more in detail. The first phase would, would uh, consider 12 of the 16 high priority species. Collection of those species took place in the fall of 2018. And what's most important about this is that it solidified the processes, the logistics, the needed staff, all of the, the details that would make future phases possible. And of course, genetic sampling started to take started to be done an analysis of those an analysis of those um, genetic samples were completed. Corals were bought back from the reef and held at intermediate facilities at Moat Aquarium, Florida Aquarium, the University of Miami, and Nova Southeastern. Phase two is still technically going on and that includes the collection of 15 of the 16 high priority species. 20 colonies per species and collections occurred between the summer of 2019 and COVID pending will continue until the summer of 2021. These are the, these are the corals that have been brought to shore, uh, Nova Southeastern in Miami, and now are, are part of our AZA Florida Reef Track Rescue Project, which we'll talk a little bit about in, in a moment. Phase three began, um, 
in May of 2020 and is running concurrent with phase two. What's different about this phase is that there will be collection of medium priority species. And in addition to collecting ahead of the disease front, there'll also be collections within the endemic zone or where areas or areas on the reef track where disease is already passed. All of these phases include genetic analysis of the corals that have been collected to ensure that we're getting a wide variety of genetic diversity. Throughout the rescue, in order to cover the traveling distance needed to stay ahead of the disease and maximize the amount of coral that could be collected, processed, and transported to holding facilities, the coral rescue team conducted single and multi-day collection efforts. To date, the coral rescue team has conducted seven of these cruises and to date have collected over 2,000 corals. Collections in reef areas ahead of the disease progression have now concluded and as I mentioned, rescue team members are now collecting from within the endemic zone. And most of these collections are taking place in areas where coastal construction will impact those populations anyway. Phase four and phase five, phase four being propagation and phase five, which is out planning restoration are all on the horizon. But where do you keep all the corals that you're rescuing and hope to one day propagate to restore the reef? Well, very early on, the team identified the need for lots of space in a relatively short period of time. They recognized that in the United States, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums facilities were probably the only entities that had the suite of resources, expertise, and professionalism to assist with the significant conservation challenge and hold these rescued corals while propagations could be built. So in August 2018, the Florida Coral Rescue Team solicited AZA's assistance and the Florida Reef Track Rescue Project was launched. Since the fall of 2018, AZA member facilities have been working together to establish holding for corals. Within several months of our invite uh, from Fish and Wildlife, systems were being built and corals were being transported. And this is the, uh, the Florida Coral Rescue Dashboard, which is a public facing dashboard. The link is there on the slide. Um, and it details almost to the reef where the corals were uh, collected, exactly what we've been collecting and where around the country the corals are finding their temporary homes. Out of the 1,901 rescued corals currently in holding, 1,749 corals are being held at 18 AZA facilities in 12 different states, with two facilities coming online in the next couple of months with the addition of two additional states in representation. So this is a huge effort and there's a lot of working parts. So let's take a look at what it takes to create a network that can care for these corals long-term. These are the facilities and friends of our project that are making this all possible. The facilities on the left of the slide are the coral holding facilities. Again, as I mentioned, there are 18 current holding facilities in 12 different states. As far flung from Florida as Colorado, New Jersey, the inner cities of New Jersey, uh, uh, Michigan, Iowa, Nebraska, all over the United States. This is a national effort to save a national treasure. In addition, we have over 50 friends facilities in 25 states that have said, hey, we can't for whatever reason hold Florida corals, but we wanna support this effort because we recognize what a crisis is happening and that this is something that we all need to be behind. And we wanna thank all of those facilities, holders and friends, who have stepped forward to help us. But if we were to break down this uh, effort into three categories, um, I would have to say that it would have to be broken down into talent, time, and treasure. And talent is kind of key. From the very beginning of this project, we realized that Coral aquarists are a very rare breed and, and really good coral aquarists are hard to find. But luckily the AZA has quite a number of them and, and began to grow that community into a network. Through AZA accreditation, we already had an established 
uh, had an established network of communication. So we were able to work together very quickly, um, base, our base our activities on ADA accreditation and established best practices available out there. We also realized that within a very short time, we needed to build our bench. So 14 facilities developed a Coral Aquarius training program that will hopefully will roll out in the late 2021 or early 2022. We also, realized, we also realized that resources were needed and time needed, was needed to, to, fill the, to build those resources. Um, on the slide there, you can see some of the time invested over our 18 facilities in the care of the corals um, in a short survey that we took earlier this year. Since the start of the, the program two, two years ago, we've also developed resources that help support our facilities from guidelines about preparation and care. We're also developing diagnostic initiatives that help us identify really effective coral uh, care and, and health responses. And lastly, within our facilities, we've contributed close to $9.1 million, which is close to 62% of the entire investment into coral rescue so far. So this network is a very important part of the success of coral rescue. If you're interested in learning more about Florida Reef Track Rescue Project or about coral rescue, my email address is located up there in the top right corner. And we also have an open network that you can link into and get the latest and greatest about the project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beth, that was great. It's amazing. It's a monumental effort for sure that you have undertaken in Florida. So that's definitely the gold standard. Okay, so um, on our schedule, we have a three minute break, but I think we're a little behind time. So I'm just gonna continue on because everyone can kind of sneak off on their own to the bathroom or getting water as needed. So now our next speaker is Anastasia Banasak. She is a leading researcher at UNAM in the Reef Systems Academic Unit um, in the Institute of Marine Sciences and Limnology in Puerto Morelos. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Marine Biology and Zoology from James Cook University in Australia, PhD in Marine Invertebrate Photobiology in Dinoflagellate Symbiosis from the University of California, Santa Barbara, with her buddy Bob Trench, right? Uh, she did a postdoc stay at Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Maryland and um, has published 45 articles and in indexed journals and chapters and hundreds of conference presentations. She's an editor for Coral Reefs and Pierre J. She's a member of ICRI and UNEP panels and the HRI Scientific Committee. Um, she does work, uh, pioneering work in reef restoration through the production and and in vitro culture of sexual recruits, including cryopreservation, allowing the restoration of degraded reefs while maintaining coral genetic variability. Okay, so Anya, I will let you take it over and talk about sexual reproduction and gamete cryopreservation in Mexico. Now, if you see the right screen. Yes, I think that's good. Thank yes. you. Uh -huh. Perfect. And you can hear me okay as well. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about the, sorry, the uh, objective two of the Malfun project, um, which was to cryopreserve gametes of Dendrogyra and Diploria and Neandrina um, from the Mexican Caribbean. But as Claudia already mentioned, um, we couldn't find colonies of D. cylindris that um, uh, in the Puerto Morelos area and the Neandrina uh, colonies were way too small to collect for um, reproduction or to um, uh, to monitor in the field. So we substituted these with uh, Celta de Poria strigosa, Orbicella fabulata, and Orbicella annularis um, because they are part of the um, highly susceptible species list as well. 
So we conducted 11 spawning uh, monitoring trips. Uh, Sandra Mendoza and Raul Tacalco, who are hired by Secor International, uh, were in charge of that aspect. And Amanda Ramos, who's one of my uh, doctoral students, um, was also helping us to collect at one of the, uh, well, to monitor at one of the sites. So we worked at um, three sites, uh, La Bocana, um, which is almost in front of UNAM and uh, at, near the pier at UNAM where there are some colonies and also at Jardines, which is a, a deeper site. Um, here's a video of um, Soda de Floria strigosa spawning seen from the vantage of a, of a coral looking through our collection net. Um, you can see the packets of, of gametes, which have um, eggs and sperm in them. The eggs have a high lipid contact, uh, content, and so they basically very gently float up towards the surface of the ocean, and um, where normally the waves would basically break up these, these packets of, of sperm and eggs, and um, fertilization would begin between different uh, genetically distinct colonies. And we take advantage of this process and collect them using these, these nets. And then, oh, sorry. Probably don't want to. Yeah, so um, we basically take advantage of this and take them to the lab and um, then do the culturing. And uh, so just to so have an idea, we monitored 67 colonies in total. There were um, 14 colonies we monitored of D-Lab in the field and four of the colonies were monitored by the uh, group at the fisheries center. And then we monitored 13 of Pseudodiploris strigosa, 23 of Orbicella fabulata and 13 of uh, Orbicella annularis. And we collected from um, 39 colonies in total, uh, seven uh, D-Lab plus three that were collected by the Fisheries Institute and six, 16 and seven of the Strigosa, Favillata and Anularis. Uh, for a total of 27 uh, genotypes, um, six of D-Lab plus the three that were collected by the Fisheries Institute and six, seven, and five of Strigosa fabulata and annularis. And below you can see a photo of um, Obicella fabulata spawning. Oh, sorry, so yes, the, the Claudia who presented earlier um, is in charge of this project at the Mexican Fisheries Department. And this is a really nice photo of, of um, one of her technicians um, hoping and praying for uh, spawning on one of the nights. So we, after collection, we then um, simulate um, fertilization basically by very gentle uh, movement of the egg and sperm mixture. We tend to do a batch culture of all the different um, uh, colonies that we collect. And um, yeah, so basically just gently moving, trying to simulate the waves. And so the, the bundles then gently break up and fertilization takes place. And then we uh, clean off after um, a given time, we clean off all the sperm. And basically um, what you're left with, as you can see here, is just a container with the uh, hopefully mostly fertilized eggs, which we then uh, place in containers for culturing through the embryonic to the level stage where we sell them on substrates. Um, so we have a, a new two-story culturing system that we um, uh, christened this last year in, in 2019. And it uh, basically increased our capacity um, to 28 incubators instead of seven. We can uh, handle 1,600 liters of, of water in each of these, uh, well, in total in this system. And um, it can uh, house about 2,000 of these substrates, which are the um, CEQA style tetrapod uh, seeding units. Um, and the fact that this system is modular means that we can handle uh, many different species at a time uh, because each of the incubators has an independent inlet and outlet. 
Um, so we can handle over a million embryos, um, settle out the larvae, and then once we settled out the larvae, the recruits, um, we kept in our aquaria, both indoor and we also have outdoor aquaria. And we also sent um, uh, samples or, uh, to uh, the fisheries department as well as to Shikari. And just wanted to mention that uh, then Magania and Sandra were the ones who uh, designed this system, which, which worked really excellently. And it was uh, finan co-financed by Conacyt and the Nature Conservancy, as well as the institute uh, that I work at. And then the, ne the next activity was to cryopreserve at least 38 vials of at least three genotypes of at least two of the three species um, from two different sites. So just to give you an idea of the um, cryopreservation uh, process, these just basically just the, um, the vials that are already loaded up with uh, sperm and they're just being placed in a rack that was designed by uh, Mary Hagedorn's group. Mary's going to be giving her talk after me. Um, and uh, my technician, Claudia, was fortunate enough to be able to um, go to um, Mary's lab and learn these techniques and then come back to Mexico and uh, teach us how to do it and apply these techniques. This is now just um, freezing the sperm at a given uh, rate of freezing and in a cryopreservative and uh, just making sure that every single vial freezes at exactly the same rate. So we now have a sperm bank that we started in uh, 2016. We have five species that are cryopreserved, um, Acropora palmata and uh, Diploria labyrinthiformis mostly. And we have um, samples from, from this last year of Pseudodiploria strigosa um, and Bobicella fabulata and annularis. Um, and so, as I mentioned, Claudia was trained uh, with, with Mary in, uh, in 2017, sorry, the program started in 2017, not 2016. And, um, so we can fertilize with the cryopreserved sperm and compare it to fertilization rates with fresh sperm. Um, we know that the sperm that we have in our system is viable for at least three years because uh, we've been able to try it in 2018, 19 and 20 and show that the sperm is still viable. And we've been able to successfully culture larvae and recruits and um, follow settlement and growth. Um, this is a photo of a Diploria labyrinthiformis juvenile in the field. It was produced with um, fresh sperm, but uh, it's uh, there it's about um, six months old in this photo. And I think um, what's really important about this sperm bank is that, um, for example, with the Diploria labyrinthiformis uh, colonies that we have, um, we were collecting from nine different colonies over, uh, over these years. We collected in 2017, 18, and again in 2020. Um, of the nine colonies that we've been collecting from, seven of these have died from, um, from SCTLD. So um, basically all that's left of seven of these colonies is the sperm that we have in the sperm bank. So these are really valuable um, really very, very valuable samples. And uh, yeah, we need to sort of work out how, how we can um, have uh, secure these samples to make sure that they're, they're not lost. And uh, also what's important is that um, we were able to collect sperm from diseased colonies of both uh, Diploria labyrinthiformis and Strigosa. Um, so this is a, a photo of a de Diploria labyrinthiformis colony up on the top left, um, spawning. And um, basically this is one of the colonies um, after it, it died from, from this disease this last year. And um, below you can see that we have um, Pseudodiploria um, strigosa and um, you can see on the right hand side at the bottom a picture of, of one of the colonies that you can see that has the um, SCTLD um, and yet it is, is spawning, it's producing uh, the packets of eggs and sperm and we were able to collect from these and cryopreserve them. 
Yeah, so basically, um, we did collect from two sites. We collected um, a total of 16 genotypes, and we were able to bank 216 vials of concentrated sperm, um, 108 from Deploria labyrinthiformis, 54 of Strigosa, 36 of Fabulata, and 18 of Annularis. And we're also involved in other activities, giving webinars, um, some in English, some in, um, in Spanish. So if you're interested, just let me know and we can uh, give you the, the link to, to find those. So um, basically those are really important in communicating about the results of the project just as we're doing today. Thank you very much. Get my button to work. There you go. Thank you, Anya. That was great. That's um, Gracias, amazing. Anya. Yeah, yeah. photos you have of those sí. corals. Sí. Muy interesantes que tienes ahí. Okay, so um, our last speaker, we're very happy to Nuestra have Mary Arborn. Okay. Presentadora Mary Arborn. I'm hearing the Spanish translation, which is odd. I don't know, something happened. Okay, great, Antonio. Okay, so Mary Hagedorn, she received her PhD in marine biology from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and she's a senior research scientist at the Smithsonian Institution. She's worked in aquatic ecosystems around the world from the Amazon to Africa, teaches many university classes, lectures frequently to lay audiences, and maintains an active research laboratory with graduate students and postdocs and is a successful researcher and active grant writer. In the past few years, she's received several multi-million dollar research grants from government agencies and foundations to support her research and has collaborations in over 30 institutions throughout the world. She's received several prestigious awards, including the Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation and the Rolex Award for Enterprise. Dr. Hagedorn has created the first genome repository for endangered coral species in the Caribbean, Hawaii, and the Great Barrier Reef, and has distributed this germplasm to frozen banks around the world. Today, she is the director of Marine Geo Hawaii, a global nearshore long-term monitoring program. And we're happy to have her tell us some of the latest um, and her thinking of what's on the horizon with cryopreservation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, share my screen well. Okay. Okay, can you everyone see that? Yes, that's good. Okay, let me just make it large. In presentation okay. mode, maybe? Yeah, there you go, thanks. Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure to listen to all this restoration work that's going on, you know, in, in Mexico and Belize. I mean, it's it's really heartening. And what's particularly heartening is to, to hear about some of the work that's going on in terms of, you know, um, preservation of fragments and, and cryopreservation. Um, I commend you all for doing it. It's very, very hard work and it's thankless. So I, I, I really think this is just absolutely amazing. So today I'm gonna to tell you, um, Anya did a great job and her whole lab, um, amazing work um, Anya. And um, she's already done a pretty good job of, of presenting cryopreservation. So I'll probably um, take you a little bit further in terms of other things that are on the horizon. So I may skip through a little bit on the um, coral a sperm because Anya did such an amazing job and has great results, but um, I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit about that. So thank you to everyone who's helped us so far and our collaborators um, and Healthy Reefs, thank you so much. And all your collaborators that um, included me in this um, symposium today. Um, and just as a reminder, coral reefs are among the oldest um, on the planet and in every single ocean, they are under siege. And so it's not something that is specific to any one place on earth, all our coral at, are at risk. And so our concern over them, I think is very well um, uh, needed and uh, 
thinking about them not only today, but in the future is, is going to be really important. And so in terms of cryopreservation, many of you probably know about cryopreservation because someone in your family or a friend may have gone to a human fertility clinic at some point. And, and the types of things that we do are very similar to what would happen in a human fertility clinic. Um, and, um, but it's really just adapted to coral. But the most important thing you need to think about or remember is that the, the cells or tissues or whatever they might be are stored at low temperatures, liquid nitrogen temperatures, which is about one minus 196 centigrade. And they can stay there for um, a day or a month or tens of years. Uh, some, some of the material that comes from the <laughs> cow literature, um, they have, they've thought um, material after 60 years and it's still the same as it goes in. It's, it basically stops um, most biological processes once it goes into a um, into liquid nitrogen. So um, uh, it, that's, um, that's amazing. So, um, but the, the thing about, um, as Anya and many others said, um, the uh, importance of cryopreservation is it can help pr um, preserve both the genetic diversity and species diversity of species. And, um, you know, the, so cryopreservation, I think, is going to um, be um, really important uh, for the future. Okay, the I just wanted to present my lab team that is has helped with a lot of this uh, collection of this data, and in particular John Daly, who's down in the the, the um, uh, lower right hand side, and Jess Bomeister in the center there. So um, what are the solutions and challenges for cryopreserving coral? Um, and the first part I'm going to talk about is reproduction. And obviously, everyone here knows that corals are animals and they reproduce. But just to remind you that, that coral polyps, each of these is an individual coral polyp. And this is what the egg sperm bundle looks like, which I just showed you, and that they break apart. And the eggs are fat filled and go to the surface. And then the sperm must fertilize a nearby neighbor. There's very little self fertilizations in most corals. And uh, unlike Anya and many other groups, we rarely go out and, 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 and build those tents, um, although we help design them for C-Core, but um, it, we usually bring fragments in from that we've collected on the reef. And then we isolate them and collect the egg sperm bundles as they um, float to the surface. And, and as Anya showed, you can do this in the field if you, if you have an endangered species. And here's um, Mike Henley doing this in uh, Belize um, for a crop or cervicornis. And then that's what the eggs look like when they're collected. And then we separate them. They separate over time. And we, we try to um, collect about five mils of, of egg sperm bundles over five mils of seawater. And if we do that for um, a coral that produces egg sperm bundles, we get about 10 to the ninth, um, uh, 10 to the ninth uh, sperm per mil, which is a really important number in terms of all the calculations that we make when we cryopreserve. So um, we can freeze and thaw coral sperm successfully and have trained people around the world to do that, as, as Anya showed. And um, Initially, we, 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 so we created the science, but we also um, helped create a lot of the, uh, the, the uh, freezers and the technology. And Anya has a really, <laughs> an older version of what we use and, and uh, we'll hopefully uh, try and bring her lab up to speed in some of the newer coral uh, freezing racks that we have. They're a little bit easier to use than the, um, the uh, freezing rack she has right now, but you see it here. And you'll see it in these pictures too. So we load the coral into the cryo vials and then put it into liquid nitrogen in the freezing rack. And this is what the sperm looks like post-thaw. You know, if you do a really good job, the, the motility is quite good. And, um, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't hold its motility for as long as fresh sperm, but most coral, if as long as the eggs are hydrated, meaning that they've expanded, um, most coral will, will fertilize within minutes. And so, you know, the kind of long-term fertilizations that we typically do for fresh coral, you don't necessarily have to do with using cryopreserve. We usually do just to hedge our bets, but it's not necessary. So one of the things I wanted to show to you are some of the flow charts or the steps that we do when, when we cryopreserve. And um, obviously you know about the collection and you know you've seen the bundles um, coming out of the coral and they break up 
But the next one is really one of the more important ones. And I wanted to introduce it to this group and it's the quality assessment. And um, we've been using uh, a system called CASA and that's computer assisted sperm analysis. This is a system that is used in most fertility clinics to understand the, the sperm motility and sperm concentration. What this does is it helps us um, standardize these measures and it, it takes one or two or even sometimes three people out of the equation. So we can, we can very quickly assess our sperm um, and, and get it ready for um, prior preservation because the quicker you do it, the better your samples are gonna be. And so um, we actually are just putting out a paper now on CASA. It took us five years to get the human CASA machine to work for coral and to work well. And so that will be coming out, I hope, very shortly. Um, so the next thing, um, and Anya showed you this, is you prepare the sample, you add a cryoprotectant, and then you're gonna freeze the sperm at 20 degrees per minute. You load it into your cryo rack, um, and, and um, then you, um, you, start, you start freezing it. Uh, and then you do a post-thaw uh, quality assessment. And that's really important as well, because if you really want to get good um, numbers of embryos, you want to know your post-thaw motility and concentration, because you will lose a lot of sperm um, in the cryopreservation process. It's just part of uh, the whole thing. And the, if you're starting out with good material, then you'll get very good material um, post-thaw. But if you're not starting out with good material, and, and oftentimes you'll not get good material because the coral have gone through a bleaching and are physiologically stressed. And um, just to, since we are really talking about the pillar coral so often, um, the Florida coral, when it first came into Florida Aquarium uh, and, and it, it spawned the first time in the Florida Aquarium, the motility was about 5%. Fresh motility was about 5%. Most, most normal coral will be about 90% or 80%, somewhere between 80 and 90%. And so 5% is very low and you cannot cry preserve it when it's that low. I mean, you, could, you can use it for a gene bank, but it's not gonna fertilize eggs really after you, you thaw it. And so, but um, most recently when Carrie uh, O'Neill and her team at the Florida Aquarium uh, cryopreserved the Diploria, um, they, it, 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 she started out with 90%. So the increase in, in um, uh, reproductive health was staggering over the year uh, uh, between when it sort of first came in and started reproducing and the second or third year. It was just amazing. So these reproductive systems are going to be really important in not only um, helping us do sexual assortment, but also helping corals that are having struggles with reproductive quality. So then um, we store and we do this in, in, in gene banks um, uh, here in the US and around the world. But one in particular is USDA. We have one at the Smithsonian as well. And I know that Mexico is looking to, for, to form a gene, uh, you know, a permanent um, uh, genetic bank that will keep the material for many, many years. So this is a list of some of the species that in collaboration with um, many of our collaborators, such as Anya, and, um, that we have cryopreserved. There's about 48 species, give or take. And you can see the different, the different areas of the world where we have cryopreserved some of the coral in those, um, in those areas. So as Anya said, we can make new coral. We can make coral babies from our frozen sperm. And um, most recently, um, we have um, used sperm uh, from across the Caribbean. This is a cropper um, palmata or elkhorn coral. And we used 10-year-old um, sperm that we had cryopreserved in Puerto Rico. We used fl Florida sperm um, that was two years old. And we, had, um, we crossed it with curacao eggs. And um, this is called assisted gene flow. And um, it's just a fancy word for selective breeding. And we now have these assisted gene flow corals that are living in captivity in Florida and being tested for um, their resiliency to heat and pH. And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to put them out um, either in Puerto Rico or Florida um, as managers um, you know, talk more and more about this and get a little bit more comfortable with putting these out in the Florida reef track. We also cryopreserve symbiodinium. And, and again, I'm gonna mention the pillow coral. Um, if, you, if you have, if you're, if, if you're struggling with larvae and, and you saw some really nice examples that um, Anya and her group did where, where they, they, they settled the embryos on the, uh, the uh, uh, tripods that the C, that CCOR had designed, you're gonna need symbionts. And most species have a couple of different uh, species that they use but 
the pillow coral only has one, one species that it will accept. So um, as we think about our coral banks, we, it's not just about coral, but it's also about their symbiodinium. And um, we successfully cryopreserved the symbiodinium in 2012. And then we had a bleaching event in Kaneohe Bay in Hawaii, where I work. And um, after that, we could no longer cryopreserve the symbiodinium. They had shifted. There was a mass shift in the bay as a result in the sensitivity, we believe, um, to the chilling or the you know cooling temperatures. And um, but we have just retweaked this system, um, having to use lasers. Um, and but we now have symbiodinium being cryopreserved and thawed successfully. So one of the things I want to tell you that's on the horizon or, um, is, um, uh, is freezing of larvae, coral larvae, and especially I hope Deploria um, larvae this summer. Um, and this is the work of my, of my um, postdoc, John Daly and uh, Nick Zahavich, who's our technician. Um, and part of the problem with uh, coral larvae is that they're very large um, compared to say human embryo. Human embryo is about 100 uh, microns in diameter and uh, many coral larvae are, are, are very large. And um, so, the, but they're also very sensitive to, to chilling. And when you're cryopreserving something such as a larvae, you're gonna go through, through zero degrees, which causes them to chill. And if you look on this little yellow inset, you will see a healthy larvae on the left and a larvae that's just been chilled to, to zero degrees for 30 seconds. There's no chemicals, there's no anything, it's just chilling. And you can see the membranes have fallen apart. So um, this, it, it, there's several different types of cryopreservation. And for sperm, we use slow freezing and we actually have ice crystals that form in the, the samples when we do it. But when you, when, you, when you do that with larvae, this is, the, this is what happens to them, they fall apart. And um, I did this for many years. <laughs> I probably must have cryopreserved over a million um, embryos, but they fall apart. And so when John Daly came into my laboratory, we decided to use lasers. And one of the things that you really don't wanna have happen is inside a cell, you can have it outside the cell, but not inside the cell. You do not wanna have any ice crystals forming. And oftentimes those ice crystals form during freezing and warming. And human embryos now are, are all um, uh, cryopreserved by a process called vitrification. And this, instead of forming ice crystals, we form a glass. And this glass is made up of high concentration of cryoprotectants, which are, um, can be DMSO or can be glycerol, often the same things that you put in your car to protect your car, um, the antifreeze that you put in your car to protect it during the summer. Very similar kinds of chemicals we use for cryopreservation. And um, this vitrification process reduces lethal ice. And as soon as we, we did this and we used the laser to warm them up at millions of degrees, we got ice crystals to stop forming. And here's a, here's a little video of what we do. There's a drop with about 10 or so coral larvae in it, and we use gold nanoparticles. Now, most coral tissue or most tissue is, is, is going to be um, it's going into liquid nitrogen, it's being frozen, and then a laser is going to hit the drop. And when it raises up, most tissue is transparent to laser energy or the energy we're using. And so we use gold to um, have the laser warm the gold and the gold re-radiates or warms the tissue. And this happens at millions of degrees per minute. Now, when John did this, he gets about 50% of his larvae swimming a couple um, hours after uh, the laser warming. So it does a really great job of ma maintaining the integrity of the, of the larvae. And um, it also, the larvae after they've been laser warmed can take up their symbionts. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with symbionts, they're those brown blobs at the end of the arrow there, um, which means it's, it's really important that they, that they be competent, right? You, it's no good producing larvae that can't either take up their symbionts and settle, and they will do both now. They settle and they take up their larvae. So we know that the laser warming is not harming the development and the competency of the larvae. Now, um, but one of the things that you want is if you're going to restore a reef, you wanna be able to produce not just 100 or 200, you wanna be able to produce thousands because they die, coral die for a business 
and you want large, you want to have thousands of larvae that you can put on the reef. And so at, to do that, we've created a system. It's called a cryo wheel. And you see those dots. Those are those are being purified, and each drop has about 10 larvae in them. And so in a in just a very few minutes, we can cryopreserve thousands of larvae. And, this is all 3D printed and, and made in my laboratory. The Smithsonian, the Smithsonian only has about three patents for technology and uh, our lab holds two of them. So um, it's all uh, because of the, the 3D technology. And so when you look at these beads after they've been vitrified and these have a lot of snow on them because we brought them out of liquid nitrogen and tried to you know take a picture of them so they were starting to warm up. But the arrows show you where the, um, the larvae are in these beads and um, we can produce just we can produce thousands of them in an hour, thousands of beads with thousands with tens of larvae. So we can really produce a lot of vitrified embryos. And this is important because if you want, as I said, if you want to use embryos to, um, you know, re restore reefs, you want to be able to hold those. I mean, if 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 I had given this to Anya um, several years ago, many of the species that she ha only has sperm for now, we could have larvae and we could actually have returned those uh, corals hopefully to the reef. Um, so now um, we're working on actually is cryopreservation of coral fragments. And um, the reason we're doing this is because reproduction, especially in Hawaii, is faltering. We, we have times where months when a coral species will not spawn or it will be, we had a whole year last year where they didn't, they spawn, but there was no uh, successful fertilization. So we know this is happening in Hawaii, it's probably ha happening in other areas of the world. And we wanted to get ahead of the curve and try and produce the technology to help us um, cryopreserve coral fragments. And what's important about this as well is that we can marry this with the coral fragment live bank program that you've heard so much about today um, from Beth and from um, your colleagues in Mexico. And, and I know that the folks in Belize are really interested in having a coral fragment bank as well. So if we can figure out how to do this well, then you don't need to keep um, many, many individuals in your tanks. We can keep them frozen for you. And then if you need them because a coral dies or whatever the case may be, um, we can pull them out of, of frozen um, stasis. So here's what we do, um, and um, we have a coral. So look at the bottom left, and we're using Parietes compressor because they have very small pulps. And so we'll take a coral and we'll start to cut it, and then we put them on these sheets. And all these little squares, these sort of um, beige squares you see, are microfragments. Um, Chris Page is working with us, and he's, he 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 helped many um, um, people um, in the U.S. develop the microfragmentation process. Um, and uh, so we have a microfragment. And then what happens when you microfragment a coral is you, you stimulate stem cell growth. And um, in the center picture, you see um, the microfragment. And what's grown out is a skirt of stem cells with, um, you can see, immature polyps there. And we take a biopsy punch and we punch that, that skirted area, that flat area. And we, we get these little tiny nanofragments that are the size of a head of a pin. And the reason we're making them so small is because we want to fit them on our laser and we have con size constraints of our laser. And in the last um, um, little, most, most recently, we just got our first um, live nanofragments after um, uh, freezing and laser warming. Um, it's not perfect yet, but we're, we're inching our way there. And we hope by, certainly by the summer, we will be able to say we can make nanofragments, we can thaw them, and we can get them, you know, um, back into running seawater so they can be cultured and grown. So um, that's our goal. We're, we're, we're I think we're, we, we're part, part of the way there. One of the biggest challenges actually um, growing these these microfragments to be able to nanofrag them. We have a, we don't have a closed system. We have an open system here in Hawaii, and we are at the vagaries of um, temperature anomalies in the bay. Whether it's warming and, and now it's turning into winter and it's cooling, and so these cause the the, the microfragments to change their their conformation and um, make them unusable for us as nanofragments. Um, and finally, um, at, like many people have said, we are involved in um, helping um, create a global fragment biorepository. And uh, as Beth told you, she's part of it. There's a group in Australia, the Great Barrier Legacy Foundation. There's groups in Europe, and obviously there's groups in Mexico and 
Um, they're forming all over the world and it's a really great idea to really help save the biodiversity and genetic diversity of reefs because it's something we can do now and it's, it's, a, it's a huge step forward. And if we can marry this with cryopreservation of fragments or embryos, and, and with um, the reproduction that um, Jamie and, and Carrie are doing around the world, it really is going to give us this enormous, enormous power to help restore and maintain the genetic and biodiversity of reefs and help restore them. Um, I have one last thing that I wanted to talk about, and that is a training workshop that we are offering um, in August of uh, 2021. We're going to offer it in 2020, but with COVID, we had to delay it, which is great because now I have the opportunity to talk to this group about it. It's going to be at the Florida Aquarium. We are going to cryopreserve Dendrogyra, um, and um, Carrie has done this with for the sperm already. But we will we will um, enhance some of the work that that she's done, and we will we will bank it so people will get trained in 3D printing of cryo racks for coral sperm sperm cryopreservation, lar larval cryopreservation, laser worming, high through cryopreservation of larvae, um, cryopreservation of symbionts and banking and shipping of samples. Um, uh, but uh, in the interim, um, this is what we did uh, because we didn't offer uh, the training workshop this year. We are, we're putting up training videos of all of these, um, certainly all the steps for the cryopreservation of sperm and other steps and hopefully that will have um, some of them launched in um, January. So um, we are going to only take a select a few people for this because we want we want to train people who are going to use this and will continue to use it in the future. Um, I was so pleased um, when Claudia came to our training course um, and then went back to um, Anya's lab and actually used it. I mean, I think that's that's it, it, they did an amazing job um, with it. And I'm just really, really pleased to hear all their amazing results from it. But for this workshop, we really want to take professionals that either are trained already or will definitely use it in the future. So um, it will happen in August and we'll put something up um, on our Smithsonian website about it. And we can also put it up on um, the Healthy Reefs um, website if people are interested in putting it there to remind people. And um, yeah, that will be in and it's, it will be tied to the gender gyra reading uh, for Florida Aquarium. And I'm not sure when that's going to be in August, probably the early part of August. So I want to thank everyone and thank the organizers of this and remind everyone that biodiversity is the planet's most valuable resource and is on loan to us from our children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. That was fantastic. So yes, I'm sure everyone in the Mesoamerican Reef would love to keep tabs on that training opportunity. So keep me informed and we will be posting it when you get the, um, the application materials together. Um, I see we do have one question for you. So I'll just go ahead and ask that while I've got you here. Um, it's from Les Kaufman who didn't use the question and answer button, Les. Anyway, well, I'll read it for you. It's in the chat. Um, he's saying, have we been given permission to keep the geographically hybrid a palmata colonies alive um so I'm, I'm not entirely clear what you're asking here last but um the um so we have curacao curacao crosses we have florida curacao crosses these are all a palmata and we have um curacao uh, puerto rico crosses um they everything is still in captivity and um, I know that there, there is discussion now to potentially put out the um, Acropora um, uh, Curacao Puerto Rico crosses to put them out in Puerto Rico potentially. We are still, I think there, and, and I hope we can have a conversation at Reef Futures um, in 2021 about how we might be able to move forward in Florida because it, you know, there's a high demand for restoration and, and, and intervention strategies like you know, many people are trying to develop. And unless we have, you know, the ability to try and even just test these out in various nurseries or selected reefs to see how they work, it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense for us to try and, and, and build these technologies of the future for reefs if managers are going to be um, so conservative and and uh, not be you know, be willing to put them out. And I think a lot of it's time. You, you know, there's there's conversations you need to have, and and that's what's great about the cryopreservation, but 
these are in live ca captive culture now and we are running out of money to maintain them. And so at some point, if we don't either get more money or we don't get permission to put them out, we are going to have to throw them out, which would be tragic. Wow. Yeah, that's that that's a sad thought. So I'm sure yeah. someone will come through, hopefully, if you make <laughs> enough noise about that. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, I'm looking at the question and answers. We don't have too many unanswered because the team of panelists here has been answering away. But um, there's one here for Eddie, which I think was good. You answered it, Eddie, but I, I'm not, I, I don't think everyone can see your answer. So I'm gonna read the question and let you answer it live if you don't mind, because I think this is something I've heard a lot from people asking this question. The question is from Claire. Um, is there a possibility of infection within the aquarium coming from contaminated water in the surrounding ocean? And are there any prevention techniques for this? Um, currently, the disease has not occurred in, a, in the corals on our aquariums. If found, the coral is quarantined under supervision with protocol protocols and is monitored in case another disease colony is found in our currents. I hope I have answered the question correctly. Okay, that's good. Um, but I think there's also, there are some like either ozone or UV filtration techniques that can be used with flow through. <laughs> Beth, maybe you would speak to that like in the, in the Florida systems, I believe University of Miami and a couple of the others do actually use flow through and they um, decontaminate the water from the ocean before it goes into the aquaria? Right. Um, our AZA facilities are, are all closed facilities, are closed system facilities, and there is a, uh, a standard operating procedure for sanitizing those, fa those facilities so that there is no cross-contamination either way. Um, our coastal facilities, University of Miami, Nova Southeastern, um, and the Keys Marine Lab, all are flow through systems, um, with the exception of, of Nova, they do have some closed systems. Um, that's a big question because we, and, and Anya's just blinked on, so she might be able to, to answer this, but we still, we know that it's waterborne. Um, we, we still are trying to figure out the mechanisms of its pathology. And in order to apply chemical filtration techniques like ozone and UV sterilization appropriately, you need to know what critter you're after. And you need to know how it moves and, and moves from facilities to facilities. So closed systems, you know, it, it is something that um, you, you need to be concerned about in designing your system, certainly, and where you're pulling your water from. Anya? Yeah, thank you, Beth. Um, yeah, we have an open system, a flow through system. We also can close it off when we need to, but we use UV filtering, UVC filtering. I mean, 20 minutes and you know, anything really should be, as long as the water is in contact with the UV lamp for you know, an extended period of time, um, it should be good enough to, to kill most things. Um, and we haven't had, fortunately, in in, in our system. Um, but of course, the Schkader system is much bigger. Um, so I don't know. I'm not aware of a UV system there, but there might be. And it in a system that uses radiation ultraviolet to sterilize the water that enters? Yes. They do. Perfecto. So that helps, obviously. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay, well, I am seeing, okay, two open questions. Let's see, something else came in. Um, oh, no, if everything has been answered, apparently. So I am uh, assuming that the panel, I mean, the um, attendees can see these questions. If not, we'll save them and send them to people, make them available. Um, for the questions that have already been answered by others. But if anyone else um, in the attendees, if you have any questions, just type them in right now. And- um, Well, I'll also um, like to answer um, the question that Ian posed about manuals or courses. Okay, yeah. Um, 
not necessarily about um, the aquarium activities in Shkaret, but a lot of the work that we do, um, we offer um, courses. We're going to be offering one online, um, maybe starting in January um, for reproduction. Um, and hopefully soon um, we can expand that to, to working with Shkaret to produce a manual. But um, Ian, I can send you the manual that we have. Um, if you'd like to see that, it's we have it in Spanish and we're in the process of translating it into English. And Melanie, in addition, as I mentioned very quickly in my talk, um, AZA, uh, the collaborating facilities, is developing a coral care training that will have an online as well as an on site training. And um, our focus for that training is not necessarily on the propagation side of it, but we're getting people up to speed and building capacity to just hold corals. Right. Um, these corals are, we're finding out because not very many of them, at least in the United States have, from the Florida Reef Track have been held in human care for a very long time. We're learning a lot about these corals that some of the researchers that have been looking at them for their entire careers on the reefs in snapshot moments during their dives, we're, we're finding out some really neat biology on these guys and, and we want to be able to share that. And, and that'll be open to, um, to anyone that's interested in taking those courses. So we're hoping to, to complement everything that Mary talked about and Anya has talked about creating a great capacity for restoration in the future. Yeah, I also wanted to just comment too that um, Shkaret is a, it also has AGA certification. We were able to get that for them a few years ago. Um, and also uh, that back in 1999, they, we were actually able to witness um, Orbicella fabulata spawning in their aquaria. So it's actually the first place in Mexico that had, that had Cool. documented spawning of corals in, in ex situ conditions. So that's really great news for them. Yeah, so it was also great and surprising to, to see that that image of the, was it a strigosa? One of the corals, yes. it was, you know, diseased with stony coral tissue loss and spawning at the same time. So that's- yeah, We figured there that possibly, you know, because corals will start investing in, in egg production for months prior to spawning, that probably, um, you know, the disease was relatively recent and they had already sort of spent the energy in spawning and, and fortunately did spawn rather than absorb the, the eggs and use it for energy to fight the disease, Yeah, which is kind of interesting as well. It's amazing. Well, um, I am very pleased with uh, today's operation working as planned and I thank Antonio for the uh, translation services and thank you all for attending and we will send out um, emails you can look on the Healthy Reefs website and Facebook for the link to um, the recording once we get it put up we'll put it on our YouTube channel so if no one else has anything to add I will say thanks and Happy weekend, everyone. Let's keep these corals safe. Thank you very much, Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Stay you very much. much. Thank you. Great, great work, great effort. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Bye.